This is Emergency FD Storyline. Any major fire, typically they're going to tax their water system. We currently have 27 water departments, and they're little rural departments, so their lines aren't very big. A big line for them is six inch. So you're not going to get a whole lot of water out of it. You know, their elevated towers are typically less than 100,000 gallons, so there's just not that much. That's why we take all of our water with us. That's typically how we set up. We don't depend on a hydrant. We're not going to be grabbing a hydrant on the way in. We're going to get there, get the engine set, get a drop tank on the ground, and get the truck and draft. Innovative. Always thinking outside the box. Resourceful. Making it work, and sometimes working with less. Dedicated. Always there for the community and putting their lives on the line. Innovative, resourceful, dedicated. These are some of the qualities found in the overlooked majority. The volunteer firefighter. The views expressed on this program are from the guest and the host and do not necessarily represent the views of any government agency, private company, or public service. Emergency FD Storyline's focus is to tell the stories of those in the fire service and to highlight what matters to our first responders. I'm your host, Tom Mann. When I moved from the big city to a rural community, I knew the fire department here had to operate differently. I didn't see any fire hydrants, not a plug anywhere. And I knew my water came from a small water department. There was always a brush fire in the distance or some structure fire. Less than a half mile down the road, there is a fire station, which is next to a major interstate. Almost every day, a fire engine roars by my house, followed by a tanker. I didn't know much about the fire department with WCFPD on the side of their apparatus until my son got his start as a volunteer with that same department at the age of 18. The Williamson County Fire Protection District, or WCFPD, is an amazing fire department in southern Illinois. Their training is outstanding. Their emergency response is second to none. And that emergency response includes hazmat, aircraft fire rescue, ARF, wildland firefighting, automobile rescues, structure fires, and some unique calls that are only found in rural America. To provide such a service to the community takes leadership. The Williamson County Fire Protection District has experienced leadership, and some are volunteers. Innovative firefighting, the volunteer heroes, that's our storyline. Generally around the country, we just see big departments sometimes. That's in my mind. I grew up in the city, so I think about big departments with unlimited resources and pretty much do the same thing over and over and over again. That's that's kind of my thinking. But they can do some amazing feats. They have unlimited manpower, resources, can handle major disasters. But that's not the reality around the country. Around the country, the majority of the fire departments are volunteer, and they're not full-time staffed departments. And with me is a department I know very well for two reasons. First of all, and when I moved to rural southern Illinois, I found myself in an area where I was being taken care of by a department that uh, does many things, and that's the Williamson County Fire Protection District. And with me is Chief Norris, Jeremy Norris, and uh, glad you could be with me. Well, thanks for having us today. And I'm a little prejudiced because if I call for a fire need, you show up to my house. And you've done that once. At least I know we had a a good kitchen fire. That's how the system works. The other part about it is I have to say is my son got his start here. He never stops talking about it. And I don't think he ever will. Your department, this department in Southern Illinois is quite unique. And tell me a little bit about it. How many stations and the coverage area, what you service? Currently, we have seven stations um, scattered throughout the county. We're 265 square miles of coverage area Hmm. in a county that's uh, 25 miles wide by 18 miles deep. So we're currently serviced by approximately 34 vehicles, pieces of equipment. You guys handle just about everything. Yes. 
on top of that, you actually supply to some of the other municipalities in the area. They call upon you for assistance for many reasons. And within the area we have, we have, uh, there's the city of Marion. You have the city of Heron within the county. Um, on the neighboring county would be Carbondale. And most of those departments have paid staff departments. And they're the typical, I would say, small size, mid size cities. And they're able to handle quite a few things. But you guys chip in quite often. Yeah, I mean, we're fortunate. Our guys are trained, highly trained. These full time departments will call us in, you know, to help out on structure fires because we go to so many. And most of your city departments go to so few. Well, let me get into a little bit about what you do, why this department is so unique, and then talk about some of the calls, your program, because you are not majority paid. You have volunteers. It's an amazing program. Yeah, we're majority volunteer. There's seven, there's four full-time and uh, three part-time. That's it. Everybody else is volunteer. So let me get into a couple of things that you do, and I'm going to name them off, and I want to kind of go through them. The first thing I think I ever saw you do was working with brush fires, wildland fires, quite often, and that's ongoing year-round. That's how we started out. I mean, that was our bread and butter for years. Uh, We had so many brush fires. We averaged more than 100 a year. Fortunately, the population has expanded. We get fewer big brush fires, but we still go to a lot of yard fires or, you know, even few acres. And what kind of equipment do you have? What are you guys using? Right now, our fleet's basically 3,500 Dodge trucks with a flatbed with a a water pack on it, a couple hundred gallons. Five of the units actually pull a UTV with 30, 40 gallons of water on it with a high pressure pump. So they can unload and we can really hit it hard quick try to get it outflanked. I know part of the key to that too is uh, your ability to bring the water where you are. No matter where it is, water supply doesn't seem to be quite an issue with you guys. No, we bring our own. ISO rates us as a rural water supply. Uh, We're a class six in that, which I think is fantastic. Of course, everybody would love to drop one more. Our board members would. And, (laughs) you know, the general public, if we could save them some money, that'd be great. But We're rated rural water. All of our tenders are at least 2,000 gallons, uh, with our biggest one being 3,000. And there's there's one at each house, so we have seven. You have seven, seven of those. Yep. And uh, seen those in action. And that's one of the things you help with a lot of mutual aid, even for some of the areas around here. Correct. Any major fire, typically they're going to tax their water system. Uh, They're going to be asking for tankers. During the big Carterville downtown fire, we actually had 19 departments with tenders all the way from almost the Ohio River coming over to to help us with that. We were supplying uh, at least three aerials flowing at capacity and a couple engines flowing deck guns. So, And again... No hydrants. We're talking about tanked water. No, they blew the hydrant up right off the bat. So <laughs> they had water boiling out of the ground. Oh, so. my. But so, yeah, they went immediately to, you know, getting all these people here. And it was a pretty spectacular fire. And once we got set up and everything running, we never run out of water. They had water, extra water setting there with master streams flowing. Crazy thing. The first time I ever saw a drop tank, I had never seen that done. Heard about it, but working with those in the city i never ever saw that tell me a little bit about that operation unfortunately it takes a little bit to set up you know you're never fast enough getting it set up but you have there's so much equipment you have to put down you can't do it with just one tank on the ground we typically set up with a four tank system uh, in the shape of a t with three tanks then flowing into one tank and then the draft engine at that pushing out to whatever they're supplying. We learned that years ago simply by mistake. We were failing horribly trying to keep up. The guy was like, why don't you put it in this shape and we'll do it like this? And we was like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You've only been with us like a week. We kept failing. We was like, well, it's not going to hurt. Let's try it. Well, it works spectacular. <laughs> so we've come to that realization that, you know, you set those four tanks up in that shape Put another one over there to run your jet siphons so you can bring the three tanks to one. We can keep up with just about anything. It's been maybe about two, three years ago. There was a very large fire, and it was over at a big furniture store. And I was watching the tank. I was impressed just the tankers coming in and out of there. And it wasn't just Williamson County. It was others. But that was amazing. 
in that particular area being able to control. And the main thing was controlling that fire because there's not much you could do with it, right. but to keep it under control. I mean, that fire was a unique challenge because we lost the municipal source right off the bat. They drained the water tower, and we were having to go to two separate fill sites. And then all of a sudden, one fill site goes down. Mm. So we had to scramble. and It worked out well. The mutual aid around here is just spectacular. You call anybody any time of day, they're coming to help you. It doesn't matter. How, how many departments are involved with it? Uh, that one, I think there was around 20. 20? 20 departments involved. And it was a long Saturday afternoon. I want to come back to the mutual aid because, again, it's, it is kind of an amazing thing. I'll see something. I'm like, I've never heard of that department. And you'll see an apparatus or a tanker or something showing up. And I'm um, like, where is that? I have no idea. Right. <laughs> so it's like, never seen that. Don't know who that is. Well, let me ask you some other things, too. Structure fires, you know, you have a wide range of structure fires that you deal with because you can be the typical home, business, but you guys get into everything from the uh, rural farms to industrial, pretty major things that can happen around here. Yeah. I mean, from um, a single wide trailer or a camper on fire to, you know, ice and electronics out there, or electronics manufacturing, they blew up a power conduit inside of it one Saturday morning. So, you know, we do, we do everything. It's just all the unique stuff that keeps us. Talking about that station, the station is just down the road for me. I was amazed how quick the response was. Three minutes, five tops. Right. Stations are spread out strategically, which I have noticed. Right. That was done early on, try to, you know, to help when we formed to try to get that lowest ISO number possible. It, it seems to have worked. We could use more, of course, but we simply don't have the population to justify it. We've got to have people to respond. And where they're at now, it seems like we've, we've got a good bunch of people in all of them. Our volunteers are just great. The rural farm fires, um, there's always amazing uh, things that I've seen. Uh, the one which I've mentioned where it was just a bunch of hay bales but they were in some kind of a container and and again what do you do with with hay or straw or anything like that it's a total different animal yeah with hay you just protect the exposures it's it's runt as soon as it catches on fire you can't feed that hay it's not good for anything so you protect the exposures let it burn down and that was some kind of plastic structure i believe that they had it in uh, you know, you protect the surroundings, let that burn down. You might be there for a while, but there's nothing you can do with it. You can try, you can dump millions of gallons of water on it, but it's never going to go out. But you got a major interstate going through this area. Should you guys handle all the rescue, the automobile accidents, truck accidents? Hazmat gets involved with that? Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, this section of I-57 that we have in our coverage area is one of the, it seems like one of the busiest as far as wrecks in the entire state. You know, two and three a month, you know, most of the time it's just automobile, but semis and they haul everything through here. We had just one the other day, they had liquid oxygen tank. It was a f hauling fish, you know, to stock ponds with, and they had had a liquid oxygen tank on it. Runs off the road breaks it off there ain't nothing you can do with it just let it bleed off yeah i mean literally everything we've been out there for various uh chemicals um hazardous materials of all sorts uh, my favorite one is uh one night we got report of a uh, brakes on fire on semi southbound at about the 60 mile marker which is just north of johnson city we're responding up there i'm in route in my car First engine goes in route. Dispatcher comes back on. He was like, uh, the driver's pulled away from the trailer. Uh, he's hauling practice bombs for the Department of the Navy. No way. I'm like, Ugh. what? What'd you say? Yeah, he's hauling 500-pound practice bombs heading to Pensacola, Florida, to the Naval Air Station. I was like, what These is are that? bombs. These are real bombs. These are, yeah, bombs. 500-pound bombs. I was like, well, what does that mean? finally get up there they're they're filled with basically talcum powder and there wasn't a primer in there but you don't say that you know all of a sudden the first engine out be like oh bombs oh i think we're gonna we're gonna take the wrong road to go to this <laughs> shut off a mile or two there for that one absolutely you know like it's just crazy the stuff that comes through this through this area and then you know there's so many typical entrapments um 
I think in the past there have been some pretty major fires on the interstate with fatalities. Yeah. Yeah. Having to deal with those. Yeah, the speeds through this area, usually the entrapment's pretty severe. So, I mean, it's uh, elongated. You know, it takes a lot longer to get them out with the amount of entrapment. And again, you guys um, handle the rescue, the fire suppression, and are they contracted um, EMS? Uh, private. Private, private yeah. companies. Private companies. And that's worked pretty well for this area. It has. It's becoming an issue. You know, at some point we're going to have to address you know, or are we going to have to get in the medical field? I hope not, but... Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what everybody says. <laughs> yeah, and we've got... There's some new private companies that's actually come in, and they seem like they're thriving right now. So, um, you know, best of luck to them, and if we can help them, that'd be awesome. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was so unique about having a, a rural county department that you guys actually staff an airport... And you guys involved with ARF, you're big time with aircraft firefighting here. Yeah, we actually cover the uh, Veterans Airport of Southern Illinois. Uh, it's the commuter hub for this area. We do have uh, six flights a day coming in and out, typically on a, a Cessna 402 or the new Technum P2012, say 2012s, nine passenger type aircraft. Uh, we're boarding over 10,000 a year with that service. Plus, we do all the charter flights for the university. Uh, typical aircrafts, anywhere from a three, Airbus 319, 320s, uh, 737, 400s, up to 800s. Typical capacities up to about 175. Um, land at our place all the time. Plus, it's a huge, we have a, a lot of private traffic coming in and out of the airport at all times. And that's constantly. And I think there's even a, is there a flight school or something that's flying out of that airport still? Or? Yeah, the FBO, they do yeah. they do flight training out of there. SIU, they bring their Cessnas over to get flight time, you know, at a controlled airport. Uh, every day, if weather's permitting, there's four or five of those Cessnas flying. And every once in a while, I notice there's a stop where there's military aircraft flying through here as well. Correct. All kinds of military aircraft from the... Um, the, war, the A-10s, um, helicopters, it's a good stopover place for them flying out of either off the Gulf Coast headed north or north headed back down south. What has been the challenge with that and having a department like yours? What have you had to do? A fire is fire. Airplane crash, or it's just like a wreck on the interstate. You know, it's, it's a flying car. And the hardest thing is trying to teach the new guys how to converse with the controllers. That is by far the worst because <laughs> That's... you have no familiarity with air traffic controllers. Yeah. They're a whole different breed of people and they talk so fast. Different language. You just have to have the familiarity and the exposure to them. And I tell the guys, they was like, oh, I don't I have no idea what they're talking about. I was like, just sit and listen. And you'll slowly start to figure it out as your training comes in, you learn the layout of the airport, you figure out the flight patterns around it, it really gets pretty easy. And then being able to listen in one ear to the flight controller and the other ear to, so that's the biggest challenge with it. Other than that, it's just any, it's any type of firefighting. You've dealt with an aircraft crash. Yes. And um, again, one individual died, another one lived through it. He talks about it all the time. Tell me about that one. What was that like? I know everyone that works at an airport and works with aircraft and firefighting, it's a waiting game, a long waiting game. Yeah, you're playing the long game on that because there's not really that many crashes. But uh, that particular event, yeah, they were finishing up their day. They were doing a, a simulated powered off landing. So they, they were circling around and actually they tip stalled. They got in such a steep angle as they were banking around, the aircraft actually stalled. The pilot tried to throw the power back to it, but it was too late. The wing got into the ground, and actually the, the propeller drug the aircraft about 100 yards from the place of impact, which was fortunate that they got out of the fuel path. When they dumped all the fuel out when the wing come off, all the fuel ended up on the ground. They were drug out of the fuel path. 
Mm. And these were two experienced pilots, too. These were yeah, not- highly experienced pilots. Well, the instructor he was with, the, the actual guy that owned the airplane, thousands of hours of flight time um, just doing his recertification. And the last event for his recertification. It was late in the afternoon, like 36 minutes after the hour or something like that. We got the call uh, from the controller on the crash phone and they're at the station. We picked it up and... He told us, hey, we got a crash. You, you know, guys didn't hear that, or did you? We didn't hear it on the radio. Did you hear it just audibly? Because, I mean, the station's not that far from the... They were, they were roughly a mile away from okay. us. Our biggest uh, runway is over 8,000 feet, and they crashed north of the the approach end of it. So we didn't hear it. They ring us. They was like, we've had a crash. Here's where it's at. We're out of the house almost immediately. We had four in the station that day and I just happened to still be there. We get up there and get to it. The aircraft's upright. You actually see the person sitting in the seat. His legs, he's got down and he's actually sitting in the seat or his back's laying in the seat. He's really struggling to breathe because of all the facial trauma. So we get up there really quick, get him out. AeroVac has a base just a quarter mile away from us and they were just transitioning from the hospital back to their base. So we actually have a flight medic, two flight medics on the ground when we pull their landing as we're pulling up in the crash truck. So that's immediate. I mean, it was just... Immediate. I mean, you couldn't ask for anything better. They're touching down. We've got a closed airspace. We're pulling up. They're pulling up. We get get him out really quick. They get an airway established. They're gone in 16 minutes from the time of the crash. And he survives. He and survives today story. and talks about it, has wrote a book about it. Uh, you know, uh, roughly a year later, that happened in August, I believe. A year later, somebody comes into the station late one afternoon, two women and this guy in a wheelchair. And I'd never met him before. And he comes in and he was, I was like, can I help you? And he was like, you don't recognize me, do you? I was like, mm, No. <laughs> definitely didn't recognize him. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, you know, this is just, it's spectacular. And he gets up out of his wheelchair and actually walks over. And I was like, this is just amazing. I was like, "You, there's something you're still supposed to be doing in this world. And uh talked to him quite frequently still. So Yeah, he, uh, I think all of us know, many of us know him around here. And uh, my son and I were, was in on that one, and I remember he called up and said, because I knew who the guy was, and uh, I actually told him I was working at a television station at the time, I already knew who it was because of people calling in, and I gave his name. He said, how'd you know that? Well, I'm not going to tell you how I know that. But um, we were talking about it, and, he, and I asked him, I remember my son said, I don't know if he's going to make it. It was that challenging. And and his injuries were, oh, they were found. They were horrific. How you know how he survived, the the impact, you know. But it's it was truly amazing that day. Aircraft firefighting, you got the fire. Fortunately, I think you didn't have to deal with. We didn't have to deal with fire that day. Being drug out of the path, it didn't ignite. So the guys were immediately able to go do, you know, patient care just immediately so we didn't have to worry about the fire of it and the challenge was getting him out of that small little confined space right without trying doing any more injury because it was there was multiple system injuries and then the other uh, other victim did not survive how did you handle that that was a pretty traumatic event there's no textbook that tells you a b c d it's all different you have one that doesn't make it you have one that does and you're just wondering if he's even gonna make it when he gets right. to the hospital right because of the injuries, how do you handle that as a chief, even with um, your guys there in the scene? Well, the after action, you know, we come back in, we try to talk about it. Uh, some of the, some of the guys that weren't out there immediately, they seemed like they had a harder time with it than the guys that were up there actually doing the work. Biggest thing we just talk about it. Our chaplain come in and sat down and we discussed it. You know. And it, it seemed like it, it went really well um, as we were able to talk about it. And then in the after action stuff, we were diagramming it more. And so they kind of got a they got a feel of what it was. Uh, I know they were excluded earlier, you know, early in the thing where, you know, like Thomas was right up there with us seeing what was going on. And I 
I think that hurt them more than anything. They weren't right there up with it. My son still talks about it today. It was probably one of the first, I think the first times he, re- he really actually saw a fatality in that, that quick, that way. He had, I think he'd just come out of the Air Force at that point, too. Right. And never, never had anything the whole time he was there. He had some incidences with, even deployed, he had some, but he never had where he had a fatality like that to deal with. And I think it kind of jarred him a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it is shocking, you know, when you deal with so many of them. We had a really rough patch in 20. About 30 days, we had five fatalities in motor vehicle accidents. It does weigh on you. Everybody says it doesn't, but it does. It does. You don't forget those images? No. And, I mean, they were traumatic injuries, you know, involving fire. You know, a young mother just happened. She was on her way to get her kids, and the kids weren't in the car. If it happened on the reverse side of it, you know, there would have been, it had been five fatalities in one accident. You you never forget it. You know, you block it out as much as possible, but unfortunately you do have to deal with it. And then I'm going through the head is, did we do what we were supposed to do the best way we could. Absolutely. We got there as fast as we possibly could. We did everything that was available to us. You know, every resource that was available was there. You know, that's how I justified it anyway. We did everything we could possibly do. Because of the way the department is and how many calls you handle, you probably get a bigger taste of that where some some major metropolitan departments, they may see a lot of fire and things. They don't necessarily have to deal with the fatalities like you have. I think about that one with um, with the aircraft accident. At least you had a victim that walked in. I know he walked in to thank you guys. Was that kind of a, I guess, a good way to kind of close the book on that one where it's like, hey, we did make a difference? Absolutely. And then reading the book after the fact, you know, that he wrote and, you know, still to this day hearing him talk about it. Uh, you know, that's a win. It's unfortunately we've lost the other, you know, the, the passenger in there. But, you know, you take your wins where you can get them. Well, that should be one of those ones. A really not you should put in your belt for that one. I, that, that's a great story. I hope to actually share that full story someday and how that happened. What other kind of unique calls have you had to deal with? You were mentioning one just about the horse the other day. Oh, yeah, we had a horse, uh, a pony fall through the ice uh, last month. And of course, you usually went, going through that, that in the city. You don't get that one. No, no, you don't get that one in the city. Uh, fell through the ice instead of staying right where it was at. Decided to go all the way to the middle of the pond. We're one of our more remote stations. The actual captain out there, who's a farmer, that lives just down the road. He hops on his tractor with the the bucket on the front of it. He's responding up there, and the people there they actually have a boat. So by the time I get there, because it's 15 mile response for us they have a boat out in there they've already got the horse or the pony up on the bank and now we're coming up to the barn to get it warmed up we got it stood up and in the barn some heaters on it and the little girl was riding the pony the next day that is that's a great story (laughs) when i first moved up here one time there's a bunch of horses that got loose and were running down one of the major highways on route 13 crossing the road. I remember crossing right in front of me and I thought, I'm, I've never seen that in this city. Have you had any more like that? Or Oh, we have the only documented bear attack in Illinois happen back in the 90s. That must have been different. It was. It was. A local guy had a, kept exotic animals and he had a black bear. Had some family in. They had been out, you know, looking at the animals and feeding the bear. I mean, the bear was tame. But the uh, girl had cookies in her pocket. She fed it some cookies, but she still had cookies in her pocket. It wanted the cookies, so it reached out and literally just flayed open her leg. Oh, man. Wanting the cookies. Well, it was scared to death when she screams. It's hiding in the back of its cage. (laughs) So it's not aggressive. It's not an aggressive bear. We land a helicopter, fly the girl out. You know, the only bear attack in Illinois that we know of. (laughs) We had an animal hoarding situation a few years ago. The house is just terrible. The lady had, was a vet at one point, had lost her veterinary license, but still doing veterinary services out of her home and had all these animals. We we're going in with law enforcement to document and everything, and my guys are in there 
full SCBAs actually have Tyvex on with, with hip waders because of the amount of manure and stuff inside the home. And one of my guys come out and said, something's not right. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, something's not right in this place. Okay. So we pull some of the investigators out and we send our guys back in. They move a door and there's a bobcat. She had oh. been treating a bobcat inside You're the kidding. home and didn't tell us. Uh, there was also a, an African serval cat in there. These aren't, you know, house cats. No, they aren't house cats. These are wild animals, you know, that will bite your face off. Uh, you know, it, weird stuff like that. I mean, it, you never discount anything they tell you. The weirdest one, and this has to be the only one I've ever heard of, is we had a house on fire, actually a building on fire one Sunday afternoon. We were in class, we respond from class, get out there, little building, probably 20 by 30, no big deal. We're going to be in and out of here in an hour or so. We start dumping water on it, we aren't doing anything. I mean, this fire's not changing. It, in fact, it might be getting worse. Finally get a hold of the homeowner, and was like, what's in here? Why can't we do anything with this building? And he was like, oh, well, it's a special green construction that we found, and we thought it'd be really cool to try building was constructed out of 12,000 truck tires. 12,000? 12,000 with this special technique that they stacked these tires on top of one another and then stuccoed over them. And the walls were three and a half feet thick with two stacks of these truck tires, truck treads, basically. So you're just dealing with, with the rubber and, I mean, we're talking about tire. Over the road truck tires, 22 and a half inch truck tires. You cut the sidewall out split the tread and then just start stacking them up say it goes out at four o'clock about nine o'clock that night we finally get an excavator in there to start tearing it apart so we can actually put the thing out you know something that should have we typically thought would be oh this is a bread and butter we're going to be in and out of this place you know the next day we're finally clearing after we dumped several hundred thousand gallons of water on it with an excavator so that is crazy water supply i think i was mentioning earlier to you before we started this i guess the rule in your coverage area is the fact you just assume there's not any water tell us why it's different than in a city where you know you got a plug and you know you got the pressure well this county we currently have 27 water departments and they're little rural departments that might only serve you know a few hundred clients so their lines aren't very big, a big line for them, six inch. Hmm. So you're not gonna get a whole lot of water out of it. You know, their elevated towers are typically less than 100,000 gallons. So there's just not that much. That's why we take all of our water with us. And so you get there, pretty much it's gonna be tanked. That's typically how we set up. We don't depend on a hydrant. We're not gonna be grabbing a hydrant on the way in. We're gonna get there, get the engine set, get a drop tank on the ground and get the truck at draft. We've seen it done out of uh, bodies of water around here too. That's the one thing. We have quite a few of those. Any challenges with that or have you had to use that often? Uh, yeah, we have, we have, you know, various draft sites set up where you can get a boat ramp or something you can pull down. We have dry hydrants, which is a piece of six inch pipe that's put in that our engines can pull up at draft. We figure that with that six inch pipe, we can get at least a thousand GPM with one of our engines at draft. So our typical tankers can fill in less than two minutes. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That is absolutely amazing. So we can put 2,000 gallons back in it in under two minutes and then they can dump and just right at a minute. So it's all about the speed. When you start figuring, you know, your, that shuttle, each tanker should be able to provide you with 250 GPM. That's how you kind of gauge. Thinking about that, you get into training. How do you train that? How do you teach that? There's a book? Is there a book for that? There, you... There is a book for it. <laughs> it doesn't work real well. Yeah. It's just something we do. I don't know if you can explain it, but we seem like we figured it out really well years ago. Our first chief just hammered that into us and brought these guys in from the middle part of Illinois to teach it. And they was like, well, here's what we do, but we don't have the resources that we had. And it worked. Yeah, that's just how we've done it ever since. Majority volunteers, right? Yep. I'm amazed with the training within the department because of different types of incidences you guys have to deal with. And we were talking about everything from animals to aircraft, serious things. Uh, you got the rescue and the interstate. You got every kind of structure you can possibly imagine. Something new. 
every time. Your training program, how does that work? Well, we're fortunate. All of our station officers are trained at least to the the minimum, the basic firefighter level. Most of them are advanced, have even went past that. Um, we just yesterday got one of our guys certified as the company fire officer certification through Illinois. He's the first one that's done it for us. There was the old officer one and officer two that some of us did, but he was the first one that, that's done this new blended one. Uh, we're pretty proud of that. But each of the stations kind of have, they have their own training stuff, and then we try to facilitate as a district extrication training or something out of the ordinary, uh, some type of burn training. We did car fires last year. We went to a local salvage yard and actually burned cars so the guys could see how to put them out and then try different techniques that you can't do on the scene. That's how we try, you know, five, six typically trainings a year, something out of the ordinary where we all get together and do it. Other than that, each individual houses are doing their, their various trainings. My son talks about, at the time, the engine house where he was, when he volunteered, there was an engine there, and I don't think the gauges were working on it. <laughs> and to this day, he knows. He said, I learned listening to the RPMs, listen to that motor, listen to that thing going on, what we were flowing, what we had to do. And he said, to this day, I'll walk by an apparatus, and I can tell what's going on without looking at the gauges. And the, you don't get that anywhere. No, no. And when we started out, you know, our first budget was only $150,000. And that's how they set the district up. So you can imagine our equipment was substandard at the best. <laughs> Uh, my first engine was a, a gas motor international 1960 model with a thousand GPM pump and wow. a three man cab, 48 miles an hour on a, with a tailwind, but that's all we had. And we put out a lot of fire with it. You learned how the pump sounded then, you know, with the new stuff, you, you don't have that. Everything yeah. is so quiet. You don't hear the pump running. Uh, and it's, it's hard to train guys by feel or sound when everything is automatic now. They have the best, and I'm, I, we try to buy the best stuff available, and I think our fleet is, I would compare it with anybody in the country. You know, they're kind of spoiled from where we started at. The other thing when we talk about volunteers and recruitment and retention, I know in times past there have been some, sometimes it's been hard to get people, but now it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem. We go through stages, you know, we'll get down, typically we're around 60, 60 volunteers, and we might go a few months without getting anybody. But then all of a sudden you'll get three or four. So we're, we're fortunate that way. And you, you told me the other day, it's kind of like when there's a fire, it's almost like you have ample amounts of manpower that shows up oh yeah once you get after five o'clock you know most all of our people have jobs you know this, they come out and they think like oh i get to play by going to a fire call you know that's how a lot of them see it and yeah easily of a night i can put 40 guys on a, on a call last night we had a uh a, a vehicle supposed vehicle fire vehicle smoking i had Six on an engine company, six out of one house, six out of another house, myself and a squad, and three coming out of the airport station for a vehicle smoke. You had plenty. We had plenty. <laughs> ended up being a stuck break. It was nothing, but if it would have been something, boy, we were going to come and we are going to stomp it out if we didn't have enough water. So. Some people will think, but I, I see it as a positive, and I think it's a compliment to your department. You have some that actually stay, continue. There's many reasons for that, but you have many that have started out Williamson County and uh, they moved on to other departments. But Williamson County, this department, has made a significant contribution to a lot of the other municipalities in the area and even further beyond. And I think that's somewhat of a compliment of the department itself. Oh, yeah. Tell me about that. I know that, I know. on times it's like, oh, man, we lost another one. But there's a two-edged sword with that. But at the same time, I think it's uh, it shows what a good program you actually have. A lot of guys have went on, you know, to full career, careers in departments with it. And uh, a lot of people's like, oh, you know, you're going to lose that one. But, you know, yeah, but we're putting them somewhere that at some point in the future, it's all going to come back. You know, we've trained people that are now chiefs at other departments. Every specialty in firefighting they're in. Uh, so I think it's great. You know, the first chief thought it was great. He wanted to train us and 
just as much as we possibly could to set us up for, you know, success, but also if we wanted to take it somewhere else, we could. How are you guys funded specifically? I know that's changed through the years. but We're, we're 99% tax-based. Uh, this county is growing constantly, so our budget has been increasing uh, since 08. We took a hit back then, but it's increased ever since then. As long as it keeps going the way it is, I think we're pretty good. You know, it, we don't see any see any funding issues in the future. A mutual aid. We were talking about the mutual aid um, in the area. How does the mutual aid work around here? And it's really good. I mean, it's really amazing to me. Very cooperative. Illinois was really fortunate with uh, up in the Chicago land area with all of the municipalities that are so close. Um, they developed a system called MABUS, Mutual, Alar- Mutual Aid Box Alarm System. And it's slowly spread throughout the state. And now it's in multiple states. And uh, it works really well. You pre-designate on a simple card and that's at your dispatch. And all you have to do is say, like, hey, I want to take this to box alarm number four. And it's going to have, you know, ten departments on that card. Dispatch is going to take care of getting them all for you. Pretty amazing. So pretty much you do have that need. Oh, absolutely. Whatever you, whatever you have, you have the resources available. Yeah. No department can do it by themselves. You know, just the other day we had this grass fire here in town that, that had 30 tractor tires involved with it. And it was running in multiple directions, uh, wind-driven, going towards multiple structures. A single department can't handle that. You know, we had, I think, five Plus, the U.S. Forest Service was down here burning pretty close, so they sent some crews out. So it, Nobody can do it by themselves. I don't care if you've got 30 guys or 300. At some point, you're going to have to ask for help, and you can't be too afraid to ask for that help. Uh, what's the furthest you've had to go out, I guess, on a call or provide mutual aid? You know, locally, we've been all the way pretty much river to river. You know, Mississippi to the Ohio. You know, we were the third in, third or fourth in company on a house explosion in uh, Murfreesboro. You know, that's 20-some-odd miles. Yeah. I tell all these small departments, you know, don't be afraid to call. We'll come and enjoy. We'll come fight your, we'll fight the fire and have a good time and maybe a little fellowship afterwards, and we'll go home, and we might need you at some point. So, yeah. yeah. The brotherhood with the fire department, it, it's just spectacular. Any challenges? to the department or kind of the fire service in general that's going on right now that you can see? I think we're just like, you know, the police. We're always just one bad call away from being, you know, the public enemy, unfortunately. The, the spotlight's on them right now. It's going to switch at some point. You know, something bad's going to happen. Somebody from somewhere is going to do something, and all of a sudden we'll be in the spotlight. I hope it doesn't happen. We're just here to help people, but you know what's going to happen at some time and that's a challenge for me and then just trying to keep everybody in the best best stuff we possibly can so any advice you'd have for let's say there's so many departments that are like yours what would you tell them to do and how to handle the community the training and the department itself our biggest thing is professionalism if you're going to go out and do the job look the job Make sure you're trained up to it. Every time training's offered, try to be there and do it at the best of your ability. Nobody cares what sticker's on the side of a truck. If you, Joe Public, has an emergency, you could care less who sticker's on the side of that truck. You just want somebody to come and help you. That's what we're going to try to do. And our guys show up, they're professional, do their job. You know, if a house is on fire and the rats are running out and we're running in, you know, where's the disconnect? (laughs) <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Chief Jeremy Norris from uh, Williamson County Fire Protection District here in Southern Illinois. I uh, appreciate the time. Well, thank you for having us. The Williamson County Fire Protection District. This is my fire department. And once again, I want to thank Chief Jeremy Norris for taking time to share with us. On a side note, WCFPD is known for being the start of careers for many dedicated firefighters, not only in this area, but around the country. One of those, including my son, you can check out his story in a podcast called The Making of a Firefighter. I want to remind you, be sure to check out our website at emergencyfd.com. You can find that podcast, The Making of a Firefighter, 
at that website. That's emergencyfd.com. And while you're there, help support the production of this podcast with a donation of any amount. It does make a difference, and I want to thank you in advance for that. And be sure to subscribe and follow to be notified when our next podcast is available. And do that on your favorite podcast platform. If you would like to contact Emergency FD Storyline with comments or suggest a story or a subject for an upcoming podcast, email us at storyline at emergencyfd.com. That's storyline at emergencyfd.com. I'm Tom Mann, and I want to thank you for listening. There are many stories coming on Emergency FD Storyline. Don't miss it.